So um, I am really excited and honored to host um, tonight <laughs> um, uh, because it is truly a beautiful intention that we have set tonight. And it's also the last event of our Pride series. So I am truly honored to have all of you here with us tonight um, and to see your beautiful little uh, icons and names um, in the Zoom room. So. I'll begin with my with my uh, sort of official introduction. So my name is Jess Posner. My pronouns are she and they, and I am the director of the Virtual Y at the YMCA of Central New York. Though we are coming to you virtually and accessible to anyone with access to the internet, the YMCA of Central New York does exist as eight physical branches and three camps located in and around Onondaga County in New York State, which stands upon the unceded traditional ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee indigenous peoples. At the suggestion of one of our guests from a few weeks ago, Sora Arie, I'm going to offer a verbal description of my image as well. I am a tall, larger, browdy, a larger bodied, queer, white woman of mixed European and Jewish heritage who lives with chronic illness. I am wearing a brown asymmetrical haircut with brown glasses and some kind of funky jewelry. And I have on sort of like a colorful velvet scarf um, and a little silver round necklace. Behind me is a full bookshelf um, and some happy plants, including a flowering purple orchid. It is my pleasure to welcome you tonight. And I'd first like to extend an immense amount of gratitude to all of the speakers, audience members, and my Y colleagues who supported and elevated Pride programming this year. It is with great humility and honor that I present this final event in our month-long Pride speaker series, Why Pride 2021, celebrating LGBTQ QIA plus activists and organizers in central New York. Tonight's program is titled The Unseen Work of Staying Alive, Queer Survival, Poetry and Organizing in Syracuse and features presentation and conversation with Minnie Bruce Pratt and Fabiola Ortiz Valdez. We do have one more event in our Pride programming, which will take place this Wednesday, July 30th at 7 p.m. It is a free all ages virtual event celebrating original creative writing by participants of the Downtown Writer Center's Teen Speaking Out Writing Workshop. We are thrilled to uplift the voices of these bold, creative youth as they use their power and observation as writers to express, reflect, and image themselves and their community. Speaking Out is a six week virtual workshop focused on providing a space for LGBTQ plus gender non-conforming teen supporters and their friends to examine writing by and about LGBTQ plus and gender non-conforming communities and to engage in writing exercises related to the fixed, constructed, and mobile aspects of identity as writers and people living in the world. Both the event and workshop are hosted by Gemma Cooper Novak. And I'm going to stick the registration link here in the chat for you all if you'd like to do that. Um, and it will also be accessible on our blog post on the um, on the YMCA website. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our two speakers. Um, our two speakers tonight are Minnie Bruce Pat Pratt and Fabiola Ortiz Valdez. Fabiola Ortiz Valdez is originally from Chihuahua, Mexico. She worked as an organizer in her home country, supporting the work of Zapatista communities in the Chiapas. Fabiola has worked with migrant farm workers in the US since 2009, first as a health case manager and researcher in the egg, dairy, apple, and blueberry industries in Maine. Later, she worked as a labor organizer with dairy workers in New York at the Worker Center of CNY. She has also participated and led research projects with different immigrant communities across the country. Before joining the Food Chain Workers Alliance as their lead organizer, Fabiola was an organizer for the New York Immigration Coalition, an organization that advocates for Immigrants' Rights New York. Fabiola will speak first tonight. Born in Selma and raised in Centerville, Alabama, Minnie Bruce Pratt came out as a lesbian in Fayetteville, North Carolina in 1975. She received her BA from the University of Ab Alabama, Tuscaloosa the year after segregationist governor George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door and her PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 1979. Her books and poems have received awards from the Academy of American Poets, the American Library Association, the Poetry Society of America, Lambda Literary and the Publishing Triangle. Her second book, Crime Against Nature, about losing custody of her children as a lesbian mother, was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. 
an anti-racist, anti-imperialist women's liberation activist, Pratt co-authored Yours in the Struggle, Three Feminist Perspectives on Anti-Semitism and Racism in 1984 with Barbara Smith and Ellie Balkin. Her essay from that volume, Identity, Skin, Blood, Heart, has been adopted in hundreds of college classrooms as a teaching model for diversity issues. Along with lesbian writers Christos and Audre Lorde, she received the Lillian Hellman Dashiell Hammett Award given by the Fund for Free Expression to writers who, quote, who have been victimized by political persecution. She is a managing editor of Workers World Mundo Obrero newspaper and lives in her hometown in Alabama and in central New York. Her most recent book is Magnified, published by Wesleyan in March of 2021, congratulations, dedicated to her partner and spouse, Leslie Feinberg, trans activist and theoretician. And I'd like to take just a moment before I turn the stage over to Fabiola to introduce a third person who is not here in body today. And I'm gonna show a picture. So allow me to just share real quick. This is an image of Nikita Slade, who is not here today in body, but will undoubtedly be speaking through both of our guests tonight. Originally, we were meant to be joined by the brilliant Syracuse-based Black Lives Matter and labor organizer and luminary Nikita Slade. Unfortunately, Nikita unexpe unexpectedly passed away in early May, just a few days after she confirmed her interest in participating in this program on this exact evening at this exact time. I know both Minnie Bruce and Fabiola will be talking about Nikita tonight, so I wanted to take a moment to set the intention of honoring and celebrating the incredible spirit that is Nikita Slade. This year has been one of so many kinds of grief, and I know the loss of Nikita is one that is felt deeply and widely, both here in Syracuse and beyond. Nikita was a young and brilliant person who is certainly with us in spirit tonight. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and I'll turn over the stage to Fabiola. Once Fabiola is completed their uh, portion of the evening, I'll transition over to Minnie Bruce. And once Minnie Bruce is completed, we'll transition to an open Q and A with all of us. So if any of you do have questions or comments or reflections, um, please do throw them into the chat, which I will be monitoring all evening. Okay, so without further ado, I pass it over to you, Fabiola. Thank you, Jess. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, yes. it. great. Um, well, thank you to all the organizers. Thank you, Jess, and thank you everybody for being here with us tonight. Um, I, I would like to share that when Jessica invited me to come in here talking to you today, and she mentioned that Nikita was originally to be speaking to you. Um, and, you know, and those of you who uh, knew Nikita probably already knew that she, before Jess's intro, that she passed on May 6th. Um, so, you know, personally for me taking her place today, it fills me both with sadness, but also a lot of pride. Um, and I think it makes sense that many Bruce and myself want to sort of dedicate this time uh, to honoring Nikita's memory and her work. And through my sharing experience working with her, which is solely what I'm gonna be focusing on today, hopefully touch upon some lessons learned, you know, as a queer organizer and not necessarily queer spaces all the time. Um, so again, thank you to the organizers for creating this space where we're able to come and do this with you all. And I'll also just say personally that every time I am with Bonnie Bruce, I feel very honored and also very, very proud. So I wanna start by saying that I am definitely not the only person nor the best person I think to tell you the extent of Nikita's brilliant analysis and perspective on workers' liberation, right? Especially not in 15 minutes, uh, but that's not our goal tonight, right? Uh, and thankfully, we have a marvelous archive, really, of uh, the podcast that she did with Montanique and Money called Queer What Pod, where her and Money has spent just, it feels like hundreds of hours. It's really, truly just heaven, you know, talking about mental health and community and relationships and social justice. So for anybody who wants to know more about Nikita, that is a gift that her and Mani have given all of us. And you should definitely check it out. I met Nikita at a Marxist class <laughs> in Syracuse University of all places. Um, and as far as we know, we were the only lesbians there. 
And as far as we know, we were two of the very few people who were pretty into Marxism, but also critical of it, right? So we, we both bonded pretty quickly, but we became close friends when we uh, started uh, organizing at the worker center together. And, you know, talking about Nikita and about organizing for workers' rights in Syracuse uh, really goes hand in hand for me. Um, so bringing her into this space as I talk about workers organizing in Syracuse and in New York State for that matter is really not force, right? On the contrary, it, it would be really hard for me to even tell you about the victories and failures that we've had without mentioning her and the influence that she had on them. Uh, so Nikita, of course, organized in many other spaces. You know, she was an original member of Black Lives Matter Syracuse. Um, she organized with the Palestine Solidarity Collective and many, many other groups. And I'm sure there's many folks that they can tell you about their experience of working with her. But she did spend a lot of time organizing with the Worker Center. She used to call it the best game in town. And I, I totally agree. It was an organization led by people of color, you know, mostly undocumented immigrants fighting for justice and dignity in the workplace. And we both felt at home there, you know, even though it was not without its complications, obviously, it became like our school in many ways. We learned how to do outreach for workers' rights in industries that neither of us were employed and, you know, knew not that much about, and also to organize for immigrant rights and make and always working in that intersection along with our comrades, you know, Rebecca and Crispin and Kayla and many, many others, we, man, we drove like hundreds of miles doing outreach on isolated farms because that's how the work looks when you work with farm workers here. We helped organize campaigns against wage theft, workplace violence, low wages, discrimination, workers' exploitation. We, I know for a fact that we both understood our jobs as organizers as not, our job was not to tell or to break the news to exploited people that are exploited, right? People know this, um, but our job was to bring resources and to do education, um, to make connections and to figure out how it is that we're gonna get where we need to be or where workers wanna be. So basically to support workers to come and to harness the power that they, that they have. Um, there were campaigns that she led or participated in against workplace violence in McDonald's, um, improving housing in countless dairy farms, you know, across Western New York, Central New York, the North Country, uh, campaigns to recover stolen checks that employers, you know, stole from uh, from workers in local restaurants, uh, campaigns against the Cheesecake Factory, uh, who was putting uh, workers, their workers in danger campaigns about rapid response, you know, whenever ICE came and raided workplaces and people's homes, campaigns against Giovanni and other corporations that pretended to give a shit about their supply chain. Um, she worked in this research, um, uh, this research project that we did when we tried to expose the conditions, and we did expose the conditions under which dairy workers um, live, work, and organize in New York State. Um, and in every of those efforts, you know, we learn not to center ourselves, right? But to follow the lead of directly affected people. And Nikita was really good at it. Um, turns out that that is a quality that not many organizers have. And I'm really proud to say that, you know, we did win. We didn't win every time, but we did have good wins, like big wins. Um, we were part of the win for driver licenses for people uh, in New York State, regardless of immigration status. We were part of the win uh, for farm workers to win the protected right to unionize, to have a day off, and to pay it overtime. Sorry, that's my dog snoring. Um, and we were part of this uh, successful constitutional challenge when we sue the state of New York, by we, I mean the Worker Center and Crispin Hernandez, we sue the state of New York for not affording farm workers a right to organize. So you know, whenever workers successfully sort of plan and took on these campaigns, big or small, right? Nikita would often look at me and said, you know, this is a big fucking deal. Uh, we're changing the game over here. People are changing the game over here. Over here, meaning upstate New York, right? Um, but she would also say, you know, 
I don't think that I should be doing this work. I think that these folks should be in my position and you know doing the work themselves. So I'll share with you all that you know we did um, struggle a little bit in coming into terms with our identity as organizers and as workers. You know we had a lot of talks about what it meant for an organizer to get paid <laughs> and the kind of compromises that that makes and what kind of negative um, results would it have on the work, you know, um, which I think it's a crucial conversation to just keep having as long as you're doing this work. Um, but almost every time we end up saying, well, but we do need to get paid and we should get paid and we are workers too. And, you know, working with people is very difficult. And as queer women um, doing, you know, labor rights, it's important that we're occupying these spaces as well. Uh, but ultimately, you know, she stopped organizing as a pay job with the worker center um, and moved on into a union apprenticeship. And, you know, she just said to me and I'm sure to many other people that, you know, I don't want to be an organizer for a living. Like, that's not something that I want to do. Um, and I was pretty worried selfishly, uh, you know, partly because I, I didn't think I could do that work without her. Um, though, I also moved, you know, on from the worker center and other spaces, but it turns out that she really didn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, she was always there, fighting next to you or offering advice or just giving you the best pep talk you would ever need. Um, and I'm sure she was there for many people as well. So I don't mean to you know, talk to you guys and idolize her and pontificate her because she would hate that, right? Um, nor I mean to say that this was her life and she lived for this, you know, and she was always, you know, uh, she was always doing this. Like she was an organizer and as her remembrance said, um, if you go to, you know, the BLM social media and stuff, um, it says she was a Texas race organizer a worker to and for the world and a proud proletarian black feminist. But she was other things too, you know, she was silly. She loved fancy coffee, you know, every time that her, me, her, whoever the other organizers walk around with an overpriced cup of coffee, she would say, you know what, nothing's too good for the working class. Sometimes she would change it to nothing's too good for the organizing class. We should treat <laughs> She loved music from like just different decades, you know, as you could, some of you could hear Dolly Parton playing at the beginning. Um, but the truth is that she was one of the best organizers I've ever met. Um, so I, I appreciate you all having me here so I can share that with you. And just how radical she was, you know, she, there was new nuances with her. And, you know, many of us and I talked about this the other day, like there's no gray areas, right? If a worker got their check late, then the employer stole money from that worker, period, the end. She came from that radical black tradition and she brought that into our organizing spaces. And she also, you know, learned a lot from another, from other radical anarchist revolutionary traditions from many places in the world. But with regards to the organizing spaces that we share at the worker center with undocumented immigrants, the Zapatista movement was our guiding light you know, 100%. So like I shared before, um, after, after like long car rides to and from Albany, which we both hated so much or whatever, you know, uh, we would talk, she would text and it would be always Fabiola, this is a big fucking deal. And I'll be like, I know, how are we being part of this? Like, you know, I don't know. Um, so for me personally, as I continued doing this work. Um, one of the many gifts that she gave me was that reminder of, especially during bad times, um, just take a minute, look around, say to myself or to whomever's around me, this is a big fucking deal. And acknowledge their role that we play, you know, um, to follow the lead of directly affected folks, to not to forget the vows that we made to those who came before us and to continue this work from a radical, queer, not nuanced, deep, deep place of, of love. So um, thank you all for allowing me to share that with you.
Thank you so much, Fabiola. What a lovely tribute. I'm gonna go ahead and add um, Mini Bruce here as Spotlight and pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Jess. My sound's okay, yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much for hosting us and uh, bringing us all together, Jess, this afternoon. I think especially for me, just to have a space to remember Nikita in. Thank you, Fabiola, for bringing her forward so vividly and thoroughly in relation to the work that you all were doing together, especially. Um, what I remember from Nikita's memorial was going up to the front and there was a little table there with objects on it and there were a lot of you know there were there was a there are a lot of things from her life on the table but what i saw and what i remember was her work boots and her tools were on the table and that brought her death home in a way really nothing else had because they were just so like her, you know, they, these, these were serious work boots. They're the kind of boots that you wear where something falls on your feet. You hope they protect you, right? They were like her. They're very tough. They were useful. They were strong. They were beautiful with the use that, that they had gone, already gone through with her, you know, worn and scuffed. They were a like a tablet of remembrance of her. And um, they just brought home to me, to my heart, you know, the way that she combined action and theory and strategy. They were, you know, they were what she walked in. They were the, they were the way she walked in life. And um, what I didn't know about her and I found out at the memorial was that she was also a poet and a very good poet. She had written all these haiku and the thing that was distinctive about them, very distinctive about them, was the fact that they were poems and they were theory simultaneously, which I know myself is very hard to do when you're writing poetry. It's very easy to write, write rhetorical poetry that doesn't get through to your heart or your body. And her poems were this wonderful combination of poetry and life and strategy, and very like in many ways, the poems of revolutionary Vietnamese revolutionary leader Ho Chi Minh that he had written from prison over years. So lots of people don't know Ho Chi Minh was also a poet, but he was a very fine poet also, like Nikita. They were just, they were poems that were just very full of her life and um, anger and action. The, one of the most vivid moments I remember from organizing with Nikita, we have a picture of it. It's the one where she's in the foreground, Jess, and um, several other people are standing back from her on the street. Yeah, that's the one. So um, Coy and I and and I can't and somebody else. I'm not. I can't remember who this other person was. So we're in downtown Syracuse, and this was part of Nikita, what, um, what uh, Fabiola was talking about when she said how unerringly Nikita could define an, a moment of action around a worker's issue. There was a diner owner in, in, in the gentrifying downtown um, Syracuse, Modern Malt Diner, people probably know it, 
he had refused to pay one of his workers last paycheck. This is a very common form of wage theft. The worker's leaving and the owner just never gives them their last check. So the uh, Nikita was running a, a campaign downtown where, and I, I was part of this for a while, where we just interviewed workers on the street and asked them what their issues were and what they you know, were thinking about, what they needed help with and whatever. And one of them, the girlfriend of one of the workers came forward to the worker center and said, you know, my boyfriend, they won't pay him his last paycheck. So Nikita got a team of us together there were people who were retired, there were people who were still working, there were students, there were people from the workers' center, there were about, I don't know, 10 of us maybe, this is not all of us right here, and um, she took us down to Modern Malt, and we walked into the diner, they thought we were there for brunch, you know, they were ready to seat us, and we said, no, we're here to see the manager, you haven't paid one of the workers, and so then there was a lot of commotion, a lot of sort of yelling, and not the workers, but the manager came, the owner came finally and started yelling at us, get out, get out, you're trespassing, you know, no, 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 I don't owe him anything. And so we finally ended up on the sidewalk and the owner tried to make us sweep the sidewalk. And so I think I said, you can't throw us off a public sidewalk, can't do that. And I think Nikita said, yeah, we'll just wait here until the TV folks show up and the press people show up. I don't think they had already been scheduled, but Nikita said it quite loudly. And then we sort of stood around the sidewalk blocking the way into the diner for a while. Then more commotion, the you know, owner saying never, 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 never. And then saying, well, I don't know, maybe. And then like, well, the upshot of this was, and this is Nikita, you know, making a strategy with everybody. The upshot was after the owner said, never, 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 about two hours later, we had a check for the workers back wages in an envelope signed and ready to hand over. So that was Nikita, great, a great organizer, truly, as Fabiola said, one of the great organizers I've ever known in terms of just getting a plan of action in place, mobilizing people, explaining why in very clear terms, the deepest analysis made completely accessible um, and fun at the same time. So Nikita was the latest incarnation of the working class, queer, poet organizer that I have known in the Syracuse, central New York area, but she was not the first. Actually, I came into contact with that particular queer working class uh, defiant poet organizer um, back in 1988 when Rachel Guido DeVries and I don't even know people who may remember her organizing now, but in 1988, Rachel Guido de Vries, who still lives in the area and is a poet, um, had, had put together the Community Writers Project. And before that, the Women Writers Project. And she had gotten through grants and just good organizing, money together to bring lesbian writers from all over the country to the central New York area to teach classes of writing in the community to regular working folks. And I was, there were many, many people who came. I was one of the last, but people like Barbara Smith, Sheree Moraga, you know, they came, they lived here for three months or four months or five months and they taught the community. And I was one of the last, people. I lived here in the spring of 1988 and I, um, I began writing uh, Crime Against Nature, which were poems about that Jess talked about, which were poems about my losing custody of my children as a lesbian. Um, and they were, they were very hard to write emotionally, very hard to write. Um, I would sit, I, I was in uh, Kate Clinton's old apartment in Casanova, 
And I would sit there. I'd never lived in such a cold place in my life ever. And I would sit there and watch the snow pour down day after day. And I would say to myself, I have to write these poems. I have to write these poems because Rachel is paying me to write them. This is my job. I have to do it. This is very much a worker's perspective. Like I can't, you know, it, it, this is not a boss. This is another worker who has brought me in to be with people and to write poem, and to write these poems. And I just, you know, made myself write them. It was the hardest work I'd ever done in my life up to that point, not even including the time I worked in a clothing manufacturing factory on the assembly line. To talk, and the thing I learned from that experience and from later experiences is about the, is about the relationship of, of words to survival and to work. That writing poetry is not organizing. Sometimes poets would like to think that it is, but it isn't. Um, but what I, what I did learn is that po poems can help us survive to keep struggling and to keep fighting for justice. And I know that not in a theoretical way, but that over the years, I get these messages, they're like messages in a bottle from people you know, who write to me, you used to write postcards or letters. Now I get Facebook messages. And they say, I was working on a fishing boat in Alaska after I lost custody of my children and I thought I was gonna die. And then I got your book and I knew I could keep living. Or somebody who says, I've been working in an emergency room and I keep your poems in the locker of, of where I change clothes. and in between you know, tasks, I go and I read another poem so I can keep going or just not so very long ago because I post poems every week on Facebook. Somebody left me a message in the middle of COVID that said, I got up this morning and I didn't think I could get up and keep going. And then you, you, I saw your poem on, on Facebook and I read it and I knew I could get up and keep going. And I'm not talking just about other people either, because when I moved here with Leslie in 2008, she was very sick. I had been teaching at um, Syracuse, and but I lived in Jersey City with her most of the year and just commuted here on a part of the time. And she was too sick to live by herself in Jersey City. So we moved up here to the Holly Green neighborhood where I still live, where we, where we moved. And she started making photographs because it was too hard for her to, to keep writing because of her illness. And I started walking around the neighborhood to, to try to write poetry because we knew she was very sick and we thought she was gonna die, but we weren't sure. And, um, and I just kept looking trying to pull in a poem every day or so to help me keep going, really, just to help me keep struggling and to stay alive. Um, and we did, we kept going and we worked and we worked and we became part of life here in Syracuse, along with other people. When Letitia Green was murdered, Leslie helped with the community around that. When, um, C.C. McDonald was jailed in Minneapolis and became part of the resistance against racism in, in, in Minneapolis. Hey, Sylvia. Um, uh, she started an international campaign with photographs, Free C.C. And so when the trans ordinance got passed in Syracuse, everybody came out and stood on the front steps of City Hall and we got Free C.C. signs, we took a picture of all the people who were part of passing the trans ordinance here in Syracuse to be part of the Free C.C. campaign internationally. So I guess I'm talking about all this just to say, it's really easy when we think about the work we're doing right in our community to forget 
how it ripples out to the rest of the world. It really does. Certainly Nikita's work did that. Fabiana Ola's work did that. Leslie's work did that. That um, if we're doing art, not for art's sake, but as part of the struggle of the world, then that can go out into the world and help people in the struggle and also help us ourselves stay alive. Um, certainly when I was writing, when I was writing during that difficult period when Leslie was so ill, there was a wonderful initiative going on, the Workers' Center, that was not part of the, the immigrant rights organizing per se. It was called the Radical Education Collective. And it was a group of people who I had known from the occupation of the um, administration building in 2004 on Syracuse University. I had known them from that and from classes. And they started this project to do education in the community. And one thing they did was start a writing group. So about once a month, we got together and, and did writing together. Again, not disconnected from everything else that was going on. Part of, you know, part of all, all of those interconnected efforts, the being queer, the being out, the being for justice and for love at the same time and uh, trying to put it into action and trying to put it into words simultaneously. I know one of the things I loved about Nikita was that she loved, she loved language as much as she loved justice, but she wanted language used with precision in the cause of justice. And that is certainly what revolutionary poetry can be. So I just want to end my part of the program by reading um, in honor of Nikita, um, one poem. Um, I, one of the things I remember about Nikita is I did a poetry reading at the Downtown Workers Center, Bill Member's great down, you know, Downtown Workers Center series. And I was paired a, with a poet who had a kind of milk toasty uh, distant she was writing about anti-racist work, but it was in this kind of soft, distant way, very earnestly, but it had a feeling of distance to it. And so she finished and Nikita was there with a group of people and I got up and I started my reading and I don't remember now exactly what I read, but I was very, you know, fiery. And I could see Nikita in the back of the room, like pumping her fist. <laughs> Something if it's like, yeah, that's how you do it, right? She wanted that um, always, the infusion of angry, loving passion into everything. So, um, so this is magnified. And these were written for and in relation to Leslie, but they, they certainly connect to many, many other lives as well. This is called Do Not Seek to Remain. I'm reading Marx in the Eastwood McDonald's. Fleetwood Mac is singing, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Marx is saying, do not seek to remain something formed by the past, but in the absolute moment of becoming. The words are ripping up the moment and I fall into a tomorrow without you. No morning, no night, no sleeping, no waking, no dawn, talking about what is the present. How do I go on? The way yesterday a tree shook its small crescents of seed, Angled for planting, sickled for reaping, red in the blue sky. They answer in things, not words, but I yearn to talk to you. To talk to you without end about what makes that beauty and what that beauty makes 
of us for Nikita. Thank you so much, Minnie Bruce. I'm going to bring us all back. And I'd first just like to really thank Minnie Bruce and Fabiola for creating such a beautiful space of memory and honoring Nikita's spirit and her practice and the community that you all held together. Um, you know, I believe that through the stories that you shared, right, both about her specifically and then also of memories adjacent and the legacy from which she comes um, truly does give us an idea, right, of the beauty of the queer community, right, that you all experienced through her um, in the search of justice and love and joy and the um, angry living passion, you know, <laughs> um, that I, you know, experienced peripherally with Nikita because I didn't have the the privilege of getting to know her well, but we circled for a long time. And, um, and I was really looking forward to actually sharing the space with her tonight as a way of building that relationship. And so um, I'm <laughs> feeling very moved as I'm sure you both are and the folks that know her are as well. So I just wanted to thank you for filling the space with her spirit um, in a way that I hope that she would appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> she would be who knows what she'd be saying right now but something quite outrageous she wouldn't let us get too serious <laughs> outrageously unseriously serious Nikita yeah 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 she would have also hated that I outed her about her fancy taste is in coffee <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yes oh my goodness so yeah. I do have a question, actually. I have a few questions um, to kind of get us started and warmed up for the last portion of our evening together. But I'd love to invite the folks that are here with us now to also submit into the chat. I will venture over there once we get a few things rolling in. Um, but there's a few things. One question that really kind of like popped into my mind during your poem, Minnie Bruce, was this, this, this concept of yearning, which is something that I find to be um, something that I experience quite deeply in it come, when it comes to justice work, to connection to community, and also to like lesbianism. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I was wondering if um, you know either of you would like to reflect on this idea of yearning and like what that means to you in your work, right? As an integrated embodied person who, um, you know, does many of these different kinds of levels of work. So would you like to start Minnie Bruce? And then maybe if Fabiola would like to respond, she can too. No, gosh. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, well, it's a good question. I think um, I, I, I've been. I, it's a good question in to, for me right now because I think I've been thinking about this slightly differently because of what I'm working on right now, but but also because I was part of a um, a Pride poetry reading yesterday with people from all over the world actually, and I got to hear what some younger poets, if younger generations than me are writing about yearning, literally about, you know, yearning for sexual sex and sex and their sexuality in certain kinds of ways. And um, so I think that the way that the yearning for justice and the yearning for, for being who we are sexually, the way that overlaps, is that even now, it's very hard to get even a glimpse of what the desired one or being is mm. in this world. Like it's so covered up for everyone. I, you know, either a person that you might desire, like actually believe that you sh you can and could, and it's okay to desire them. That you you haven't even imagined it. You know, like where are they? You can't. I think that's what the yearning is. You haven't imagined it yet, so that it, you're not even at desire. 
it, but the queerness uh, is so still so covered and talk about justice. Like, where do we see that, please? You know, like, where do we see what it might even begin to look like? If you know, you know, if you've been to Cuba and you have had, I don't know, for instance, like travel down a highway where there are no billboards for pay, you get an idea of what beauty and justice might look like if you travel down a highway in Cuba. Not a single paid advertisement anywhere, maybe something for the literacy campaign, right? As a billboard, right? So, but you know, everything is so covered up under capitalist, anti-queer, anti whatever, you know, anti-black, anti-indigenous, anti-socialist, anti-communist. It's just so covered the images that we're yearning, but we don't always know what we're yearning for, mm. right? Until we get a little glimpse, like maybe somebody hears a poem or sees something forbidden. Um, there's a little bit more possibility now than there has been, but that's because the mass movements have made things visible. And then, you know, capitalism then tries to rip that off and make it pay. But the, the movements just keep coming. We just keep coming with new, you know, visions and, and trying to break through with that vision past all the misinterpretation and the lies so that people who are yearning can find actually what they're yearning for. Thank you. Fabiola, would you like to reflect on yearning? I think I just need a minute to reflect on what many verse said. I would love to share some of the comments that came into the chat. I'm just gonna go ahead and read them. From Carolyn, we have, I remember hearing about Rachel Guido DeVry's Women's Writers Project. What a great program. Thank you for telling us about it so vividly. That was such a beautiful tribute. Thank you both. And from Toby, we have a message that says, thank you both for this wonderful tribute. I'm looking forward to hearing your poetry reading at Art Rage on July 8th. Hey. Yeah, I should, I should say something about that while the topic is on the floor. Um, the pictures that Leslie made about the Holly Green neighborhood are up in an exhibit at the Art Rage Gallery. And it is a disabilities justice exhibit because she made them as someone who was um, limited and confined in different kinds of ways by her illness. And she'd been involved with fighting for disability rights for, for her whole life as an activist. Um, and, um, and then did these pictures at the, toward the end of her life. So I really encourage people to go to Art Rage and see the, and see the exhibit. There's a long artist statement and pictures from her life to sort of shed light on it as a disabilities justice uh, photo exhibit. It's under Art Rage Gallery online. Art Rage Gallery is how you can get the information. And on July 8th, as part of the, you know, promoting her exhibit and welcoming people in, I'm gonna do the, what I think may be the only in-person reading from Magnified because of COVID, I'm doing Zoom readings, but I'm gonna do an in-person reading at the gallery on July 8th, but people need to make reservations to do that. I think we can hold about 30 people maybe with, you know, um, with um, precautions, but, um, and it'll be a reading in tribute to Leslie and Nikita and everybody who's loving life, justice and poetry. Wonderful. I'm just um, looking up the website right now so I can share it with folks. And it's actually on the chat, actually. Oh, oh wonderful. Dustin has thoughtfully posted okay. it on the chat. Dustin, thank you for doing that legwork. Um, Really appreciate the community effort that we actually have going um, in these uh, in these events. We've had each one of our events, which have had a, been a slightly different subject, but all 
gathering and focusing LGBTQIA plus identifying individuals who are based here in Syracuse. So I really do appreciate the kind of community participation in that way. Um, so I guess in closing, you know, because we've just got a few more minutes, um, I would love to maybe pose one more question to both of you, um, something that you both spoke to, which was this balance really between joy and struggle. And I was curious if you would like to maybe speak a little bit about that, about how that manifests for you personally or professionally or um, socially, and to really kind of like give us a little bit of insight into how you achieve that balance, how you work towards that balance and create it and how you recognize it. Um, because I personally too have found that that's one of the most important things, you know, doing work that is challenging that, you know, when we face some of the darkest parts of our ourselves and others and our community, we have to fill that well through joy and celebration of being together. So whether it be a story or a reflection, um, I was just wanted to invite you all to kind of wrap up the evening with some words on that. So um, would you like to start Fabiola? Sure, I can give it a try and, you know, have a, have a monster running around here. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of joy, right? Um, I guess I'll go in that direction a little bit, uh, just organically. Um, you know, I feel like, I mean, COVID was something else, but whenever I've been lucky enough to be in several organizing spaces, I'll say that whenever there are spaces, they're like multi-generational um, spaces. It's just, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how we do it without that, you know what I mean? Um, we made an effort. There was also the childcare um, collective, also out of the same building where Minnie Bruce was talking about the radical education collective, the worker center BLM, like all of us were in that physical space, probably not by accident, right? Um, we sort of were very intentional and like whenever we showed up with our families or, um, yeah, especially with like little ones and stuff like that, we didn't talk about, you know, even though a lot of us show up with our kiddos and stuff out of need because there was no <laughs> childcare uh, support, um, you know, the way that we created this space is as like not separate space, you know, not to entertain the younger generations while we do this work, but like sort of like include them and be inclusive in this space. It was incredibly joyful. It really was, and you know, and it made you know, it was also hard because you could see kids, a little older kids, older than my kid, you know, just understanding why we were there, you know, understanding why we were talking, what it was an ice raid, you know, understanding like what was to have your pay taken away and all the stuff. So it was also painful, but the joy that um, being in those intentionally built multi generational spaces. Um, was just uh, like a lifeline, I think. And, you know, just to bring it back into Nikita a little bit, who was also great with kids and she was a fantastic tia to my kid and to many kids, I'm sure. Um, there was no, here we, we will be talking about what you know, the most stressful, rageful things. It was really no meeting that we did that ended up with a chuckle, you know, that didn't, end up with just a Bruce Springsteen sing-along, <laughs> talking about how handsome he is, you know? Like, it was always that, they, like, it, but it, it didn't feel like a very, like, it felt very much like part of our job because we're not just our, we're not, we're not just our tragedies, right? We're not, we're not just our challenges. So I think that finding those ways to celebrate ourselves and our community and our fight. It's just, um, I don't think that we can do this work without them. But I do think that, you know, you at times, because the world is what it is, you have to be like very intentional in doing that. And I think that that's one of the reasons why COVID was pretty hard, right? Because we were very limited in that regard, but, um, yeah, because that's just what I mean, comes to mind right now. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I resonate with what a lot of you said, 
with a lot of what you said in terms of um, thinking about the beauty of intergenerational spaces, especially ones um, of chosen family, right? And how that also becomes an opportunity for the youth to learn, for our elders to share, and for us to witness each other, right? As we continue to step into the work. And I have found that to be such a gift, you know, um, going in both directions. So thank you for sharing that and introducing that because a lot of us who live in chosen family may not have those family structures easily accessible to us, if at all, right? Um, so it is it is quite beautiful to kind of like think about how we may choose to re-enter some of these spaces intentionally, right? Now that we have an invitation to kind of like do so in some limited ways, right? Because of the vaccine, because of, you know, um, because of the ways in which we are able to begin to return, you know, um, and hopefully we'll continue down that path right, with the support of science and cooperation and all that. So um, thank you for that and for reflecting on that and also for sharing about Nikita um, once again. Hmm. Minnie Bruce, would you like to reflect on this? I don't really have anything to add. I, hi, hi. <laughs> I, um, I resonate with what Fabiola has said. I think one of the things that is joyful about a multi-generational gathering is that we get to see that we get to see from people who are younger than us and coming along now, we get to see that what we did in the past has made a difference. Mm. We, if, we, if we really listened to them, you know, if we really listen and engage with people of a different generation than us who are younger, if we're truly interested in what they're thinking and what they, their perspective is and what they know, then we will find out that we did make a difference in all these struggles, you know, that might not have been felt so joyful when we were doing them. I, I, I think the only other thing I will add, and this was one of the things that was difficult about COVID, I feel that the most, really some of the most joyful times in my own life, apart from just my time with Leslie, have been when I've been part of mass demonstrations for justice. Truly euphoric to be, I don't know, two weeks after 9-11, forces called a, an action in Washington, D.C. to say no war. People probably don't even remember that anymore. Two weeks after, there were 30,000 people in Washington marching against having a war. You know, just this incredibly euphoric, joyful hours of being with thousands, tens of thousands of people who are on the right side of history and are singing and dancing and chanting and doing all those wild things people do at marches. And uh, I'm hoping we can have some more of that. <laughs> we had it during Black Lives Matter, thrillingly, thrillingly. It, here in Syracuse and all over the country, the largest, the biggest demonstrations for justice in the history of the US happened during the COVID epidemic, pandemic. And it's, you know, you're not gonna hear them still talking about that on the mass media. The, the, the big business media, but that's the truth. My hometown, a thousand people in the heart of Alabama, very conservative county. The first demonstration for against racism that I know that has ever happened there, maybe others happened, but I didn't see them. There were two marches last year in my hometown to take the Confederate statue down that has the name of one of my forebears on it. Now that is, talk about joy. That is a truly joyful moment. And all over the country, this was happening. This is gonna reverberate for decades. And, and it comes out of this, you know, angry, yes, but also joyful, like together, you know, together. Nikita always brought that, always, together. Thank and you. Leslie, and Leslie too, Leslie. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Thank you so much for bringing um, Nikita and Leslie into our conversation and our space tonight. Um, I personally look forward to spending more time with all of them and also with you and everyone here. So, um, you know, please don't be a stranger. Um, if you would like to connect with me, you can reach me at my email, which is virtual at ymcacny.org. And, um, you know, if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about, would like more details around Minnie Bruce's reading next week, um, you know, or to just kind of connect around events, I do organize and promote a lot of events around Syracuse, not just through the YMCA. So I would love to see any and all of you at all of those. So. Um, um, and there's Fabiola's contact information, um, and we will be happy to uh, send that out in a follow-up email that I will once all of our um, sort of like recordings are made, you know, available on YouTube. Um, and uh, there's many Bruce's uh, contact as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to, again, thank everybody for your presence um, and for your questions and for your reflections and for generally just making this a really beautiful evening, which was part of a really um, significant effort by the YMCA to support and give visibility and voice to local LGBTQIA plus organizers and activists. I started working and not to like talk about myself here, but like I, I joined the YMCA in November, the day after the election. And I was hired as the virtual director um, for our new virtual YMCA and began doing speaker series as a way of bringing um, community partners and folks together to build relationships and also to extend uh, what we can offer as a why, you know, because what I didn't necessarily know coming into the why was that it's actually a very socially progressive, committed nonprofit organization who is here for all and is here for a lasting justice. And so it has been incredibly meaningful um, to be able to head some of this programming featuring um, such luminaries as yourselves <laughs> and the other folks who have been here with us over this month um, as a national model, actually. Actually. So it's been quite moving to be um, able to do this on behalf of not only our local wise, but also for those that are looking to more visibly and fully step into justice work, which is challenging because wise are everywhere, right? People have perceptions about them. So I just wanted to thank you all for trusting us and for trusting me <laughs> um, to hold this space tonight because I know that um, we are working together to reach more people, right? Um, both to those people in the room, but also those will, that will have access to this through our archive. So I just wanted to really thank you um, specifically for that and to everyone who has uh, eyes and witnessing tonight and at whatever time you engage with us. Thanks for having us, Jess. Thank you, you are so very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Fabio. <laughs> <Thank you, Bobby. laughs> so in closing, I'm gonna play some Bruce Springsteen. Mm -hmm.